The mid-2000s was a great time to watch TV for an action fan. You had 24, Chuck, and so many more. It was a magical time to be a TV nerd. As I stated in my Dark Angel review, Women Kicking Ass was in full swing on TV by this time, and one of the most popular kick-ass heroines on the small screen was Sydney Bristow, the star of J.J. Abrams' spy adventure, Alias. It's not surprising that this show was adored by many. It had great action, appealing characters, romance, drama, and a little bit of weirdness thrown in for good measure. But did Alias go too far into the weird, or does this show still hold up after taking off the nostalgia goggles? Let us find out in this episode of Gone, But Not Forgotten. <laughs> Alias was created by legendary writer, producer, and director J.J. Abrams. If God forbid you don't know who Abrams is, then you will know his work, as he is the man behind both Star Trek and Star Wars recently hitting the big screen. Some people love him, some people hate him, but whatever camp you're a part of, you can't deny he's had an impressive career in television and film. J.J. has been working in Hollywood since the early 90s, writing some of my favorite dramas like Regarding Henry and Forever Young. He was also one of the co-writers on the Michael Bay blockbuster Armageddon and created the WB drama Felicity, which ran for four seasons. Alias would revolve around Sydney Bristow, a college student who believes she's working for a secret branch of the government called SD6. During this time, Sydney goes on covert missions for the government. She is told that SD6 is black ops and that if anyone in her life learns the truth, they will be killed to help protect national security. Unfortunately, when Sydney's boyfriend proposes, she tells him the truth. When this is found out and he is murdered, SD6 tries to assassinate Sydney for refusing to come back to work. But her father saves her. And at this point, she learns the horrifying truth. SD6 is not part of the government, but rather a criminal organization that uses murder, theft, and political machinations to further its own greed. This is when Sydney becomes a double agent for the CIA to take down SD6 and their allies. The idea for Alias was born when Abrams was working on Felicity. He said that during production, he thought to himself, wouldn't it be funny if Felicity was secretly a spy? This idea stuck with him, and soon he found himself writing the pilot for this show. Now the casting for Alias is interesting. JJ said he tried to write Sydney as her own character, but later admitted that he had Jennifer Gardner in mind for the role. He had been impressed with her ever since beginning to work with her on Felicity, but the network fought hard against Abrams casting an unknown actress that had only had a small part on a hit show. One executive said, quote, she's not hot enough. They made Abrams audition other actresses for the role, Jenna Fisher being one of the most notable actresses to campaign for it. But she wasn't picked because, again, the network said she's not hot enough. But JJ argued for Jennifer, and after auditioning five times, she finally got the role. Garner said that one of her favorite memories was when she found out she was cast as Sydney Bristow. Gardner was watching the movie Traffic when she got a phone call and stepped outside to get told by her agent that she got the role. She went back to watch the movie and said that she was so happy she watched the rest of that film like it was a romantic comedy. Victor Garber is an amazing stage, film, and TV actor. He's an iconic Broadway actor, part of the original cast for Sweeney Todd, Death Trap, and my personal favorite musical, Assassins. His film career is very impressive as well, one of his most famous roles being the tragic creator of the Titanic in James Cameron's mega blockbuster, Titanic. He said that he was confused when he was asked to audition for this show, saying he didn't fit the mold for that type of character. Garber even stated he saw another actor audition that had the type of look he pictured for Jack Bristow. So he was surprised that he was chosen, but glad that they did. And frankly, I don't know what he's talking about. I think Garber kicked ass. I mean, just look at this scene. Don't tell me. We've come to the point where you coerce me into cooperating. Not exactly. <laughs> In seven seconds, you will begin to see spots. You think it's a white light, but I'm here to tell you. The last words I want you to hear ever. There is no white light. Not for people like you. <laughs> Victor Garber and Jennifer Garner are still close to this day, 
he even officiated her wedding. Michael Vartan played Sydney's true love, Michael Vaughn. Vartan said that his audition was a train wreck. He was nervous and sweating buckets. He turned to J.J. Abrams and said, J.J., I don't think I can do this. To which Abrams replied, yes, you can. He then relaxed and gave a performance that got him the job. The chemistry between Vartan and Garner was amazing. It's not surprising since they wound up dating in later seasons. I wish Vartan's career would have gone in a better direction, since at this time his roles are very small. But he's currently co-hosting a weekly live sports program called Advanced Shouting, which you can watch on YouTube. Another actor whose career exploded after he left the series was Bradley Cooper, who played Sydney's best friend Will Tippin, a reporter who's secretly in love with her. I liked Will, but his story was not as integrated with the main plot as I would have liked. Cooper hated working on the show due to the schedule, which sometimes could go on as long as 15 hours a day. He wound up asking to be written out of the show because he said he was going through major depression due to this grueling schedule. Another factor for Bradley leaving was that he wasn't happy with the material that he was given. In an interview with TV Line, J.J. Abrams said, We weren't coming up with things that were worthy of him, and he was sitting around in many episodes doing very little. It felt like that kind of relationship where you both love each other, but you both realize for various righteous reasons that it's not quite working out. And you both come to a meeting with the same intention. That's sort of what happened. It was very hard to go back to the domestic stories where there's a nuke in Los Angeles somewhere. It was a really tricky plate to spin. It's a real shame because I did like this character. I felt that his chemistry with Sydney was great. They had a great dynamic and watching them in a scene together was like watching two old friends. Carl Lumbly would play Sydney's partner, Marcus Dixon. Lumbly has had a long career in television and film. He has played many iconic characters, such as John Jones, aka the Martian Manhunter, in many DC animated projects. He's an amazing actor, and I've been a fan of his ever since he starred in another cult show called Mantis. Lumbly enjoyed his time on the show. The only issue that he had was when he had to be in a scene that involved some sort of comedy. This usually happened when Dixon and Sidney had to go undercover. Robert Milton, I'm here for the Tech Sky presentation. One moment, please. Yeah, I'm so late already. My boss is gonna kill me. <laughs> Are you ready to party? And this leads me to one of my favorite aspects of this show, the secret missions. Throughout the series, the characters would go on missions mostly to steal things. The best part of it was to watch them pretend to be other people. I don't know what it is, but I love seeing the actors stretch their acting muscles. Maybe this is why I like shows like Leverage and Dollhouse. I just adore a good heist scene. Alias did these to perfection. The stunt work was amazing, the costumes and the set work were everything you would want from a fun heist. And speaking about stunt work, Jennifer Gardner did her own stunts on this show. This was great because unlike other action shows where camera work was used to simulate the actor fighting, Alias had the actors shoot most of the stunts themselves. Jennifer trained and worked hard to pull this off, although sometimes they did not come off perfectly. That poor guy wound up with a concussion. Greg Grunberg, the childhood friend of J.J. Abrams, would play Vaughn's best friend and CIA partner, Eric Weiss. As usual, Greg played Eric with the same charm and wit that he's used for most of his roles. It was always a treat to see him in an episode. One of my favorite subplots was when Eric started a relationship with Sydney's half-sister, Nadia. Finally, the comedic relief of a fan-favorite character was Marshall, played by Kevin Weissman. Marshall was a good, lovable, and loyal friend to Sydney and the rest of the team. He was the tech wizard who was always coming up with new gadgets. Wiseman said that he tried playing Marshall in different ways. Snobby, cool, arrogant, but he said that he would end up just imitating J.J. Abrams. Alias had some complex storylines. It all centered around Milo Rambaldi, a man who would die in 1446. Rambaldi was a genius and a prophet, and his involvement on the show started as a MacGuffin, a way to create gadgets that SD6, the CIA, and other terrorist organizations fight over. But as the show developed, the lore of the show began to revolve around Rambaldi's prophecies. 
Sydney was used as the chosen one trope. She had a destiny to save the world or destroy it, depending on the season. This also gave the villain of the show, Arvin Sloan, who is played brilliantly by Bron Rifkin, a motivation to continue to become an antagonist towards Sydney. His obsession with Rambaldi drove him to become a terrifying villain and also a sympathetic ally. Sloan was a fascinating character. At first, he's this intimidating bad guy, but as the show progressed, he became multi-layered. It's revealed that he was in love with Sydney's mother and fathered a child with her named Nadia. Towards the end of the show, he was even tortured by his desire for Rambaldi's inventions. Speaking of bad guys, one of the most popular villains on this show was Julian Sark, played by David Anders. Sark was this charming and intimidating figure, and Anders did a great job. Every episode he was in just elevated the show. It's funny, for years, I honestly thought that he was really British. As I stated before, the big drive of this show was Rambaldi's prophecies and how they involved Sydney. The first two seasons of the series were particularly great, revolving around Sydney taking down SD6 from within. Seeing Sydney trying to fight against SD6 and lie to the people she cares about. In the second season, we're introduced to Sydney's mother, played by the beautiful Lena Olin. A perfect scene that showed her intensity was when Arena met Vaughn. Interested in a computer disk containing information used for blackmail. We believe you're familiar with this item. My god, she looks like a cat who is about to eat a mouse. Lena Olin is simply amazing. But it was in season 3 that things began to falter. The season ended on a great cliffhanger. Sydney's best friend Francie, played by the beautiful Marin Dungy, was murdered and replaced by an evil agent named Allison Doran, who had surgery to look exactly like Francie. Allison was then in a position to spy on Sydney. I think this was great for Marin Dungy, since Francie was a one-note character up to this point. She had no real personality, and it seemed like her role was to complain that Sydney worked too much. Now she was this evil spy who was falling for Will, but also taking steps to sabotage Sydney. Sydney finds this out and has a massive fight with her, leaving Allison dead and Sydney unconscious. Sydney wakes up in Hong Kong with three years having passed, and everything is now different. Sloane is now a good guy, her father Jack has been arrested, and Michael is now married to an NSC liaison, Lauren Reed played by Melissa George. I've been a fan of Melissa George ever since seeing her in a TV film slash failed pilot called Lost in Oz. I always light up when I see her in a project. Not only is she beautiful and sexy, but she's an incredible actress. I just feel bad that when she came on the show, she got a lot of fan backlash. It's not her fault. Her character was written to be the wedge between Sydney and Bond's relationship. It was a hard role to play. And then when she's revealed to be a bad guy, that only made it worse. Fun fact for you, George auditioned to play Sydney, and even funnier, Katherine Heigl auditioned to play Lauren. The season also went overboard on the Rambaldi lore. It was a lot of stuff thrown at the viewer. The characters also took a backseat during the season, which is never a good thing. The fans were not the only ones who were unhappy with season 3. J.J. Abrams would later disown the season, he agreed that the show had lost its way, saying pretty much what I stated earlier, that they put the plot ahead of the characters, and the show suffered for it. Even though the third season is not perfect, I still enjoyed it. I enjoyed every season of this show. Still, I can't deny that season 3 may have been what killed the show. Bradley leaving and Francie dying was a huge change in the dynamic, and there was another factor, network interference. The first two seasons of Alias were serialized, but the network told JJ that season 3 would be episodic, and Abrams would give in to the network. The reason was he was developing loss at the time, so he just couldn't be as hands-on as he had been previously. All this, plus many producers leaving and new ones coming in, just created this massive shift in the direction of the show. But Alias would have some great guest stars, like Gina Torres, who played Sydney's nemesis, Anna Espinosa. 
She was sort of the anti Sydney, who was constantly antagonizing her whenever they met. Interesting tidbit, Gina Torres was in the pilot of Mantis with Carl Lumbling. Other guest stars were Angela Bassett as CIA Director Hayden Chase, Terry O'Quinn as FBI Assistant Director Kendall, John Hanna of The Mummy fame as a brainwashed assassin, Ethan Hawke as a possible double agent, and Christian Slater as a kidnapped scientist. But my favorite guest star was Rick Young, playing a torturer named Dr. Zhang Li, who did such a great job that they brought him back a few times. It was so fun seeing Rick play this creepy sadist. Please don't hurt me. Tell me, how did you endure the symphony? <laughs> and he's no stranger to playing villains, as one of his most famous roles was in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I remember him particularly as one of the villains in this crummy 90s movie with Chow Yun-Fat called The Corruptor. Not a very good movie, but he was one of the few redeeming aspects of it. Thankfully, season 4 was pretty good, but the Rambaldi lore began to get more and more dense. By the time season 5 premiered, it was so complicated that the cast had no idea what was going on. The fifth season also had one of the most ridiculous aspects of the series. Jennifer Garner was pregnant at the time, and many options were considered on how to handle it on the show. They briefly thought about using stunt doubles with her face digitally attached, but that was abandoned. And the writers just decided to write in the pregnancy. It was very silly, since there were a few times when she had to have gunfights, mostly due to network demands. But the character of Rachel Gibson was introduced to help relieve the physical burden that Gardner could not do. She was played by Rachel Nichols, who I used to have such a crush on. I'll watch anything she's in, from the hit sci-fi show Continuum to that garbage G.I. Joe movie. Rachel Gibson was introduced on the show as a computer genius who, like Sydney, was tricked into thinking she was working for the CIA when she was really working for terrorists. Sydney was turned into a mentor figure, and Rachel would become a fan favorite character. However, by season 5, the writing was on the wall. Every season after the second season, the ratings got lower and lower. So ABC would eventually pull the plug, and the final episode of Alias would air on ABC on May 22, 2006. The finale was really great. It tied up the Rambaldi mystery and many of the characters' arcs. As a fan, I was very satisfied with this ending, which is something that I rarely say for any show that I love. After Alias, many of the characters have gone on to larger careers, Jennifer Gardner and Bradley Cooper being the most notable of the cast. Over the years, talks have been had between Abrams and ABC about bringing the show back. All the cast say they would come back in a heartbeat, but as of today, nothing has materialized. Personally, I would love to see it come back. The ending of the show did leave open some possibilities, but even if it doesn't come back, Alias is still as good as it was decades ago. You can currently watch it for free on Freebie, or if you have a Disney Plus subscription, you can find it there as well. So if you would like to watch some great action and adventure, then I would suggest you check out Alias. You will not regret it. I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell and receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support, and we will see you next time on the next episode of Gone, but not forgotten. <laughs>